Hello everyone. I'm Nicola Bradbear of Visa Development. Thank you for joining us uh, and welcome to everybody joining us wherever you are. Uh, I'm sitting here in Monmouth in South Wales in the UK um, with the rest of the Visa Development team. Today we're focusing on African beeswax. It's a beautiful, wonderful, incredibly useful product that our lovely bees make for us from flowers. It's completely sustainable and its production, of course, supports biodiversity. We want to show you now how feasible it is to render very high quality beeswax from comb and that this beeswax has a really good market. Nowadays, it's increasingly feasible for people to build very resilient livelihoods, turning beautiful beeswax into money. We want to show you a little bit about this today. And the wonderful thing is that African beeswax is some of the very best, highest quality beeswax available on the world market because African beekeepers keep their bees naturally and they don't introduce any chemicals to their bees. And therefore this beeswax is some of the cleanest that you can possibly buy anywhere in the world. In this webinar, we're going to show you exactly how easy it is to prepare beautiful golden beeswax using the hot, hot water method, and then how easy it is to make value added products, to make secondary products using beeswax, and no complicated or expensive equipment is needed. We're also going to give you a little glimpse into the international beeswax trade market. So uh, now I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the beast development team that are here. Uh, on the technical side, we have Sean. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and Milan. Hi, everybody. And our moderators today are Janet. Hello. <laughs> and Giacomo. Hello. And then we have also joining us today, uh, I see here from Ghana, we have Isaac. <laughs> Isaac's with us from Beast Development. Hello Ghana. everyone. <laughs> and also Kwame is with us, but your camera's not on Kwame. <laughs> Anyway, hello from Kwame. And then we have Ezekiel joining us from Uganda. Hello to everyone. Hello there, hello. And then very good, from Costa Kunan, we have John Costa. Hello. <laughs> and John Metaxas also joining us. Hello. Very good to have you both with us. Great. So now what I'm going to do is hand over to Giacomo who's going to explain how the webinar works. Welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be connected. I hope you can hear and see us all right. Uh, if you are having trouble with the streaming, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel because we will be recording this session and posting it on there. Uh, for the housekeeping on the bottom toolbar, you should be able to see there's a button called Q&A. Uh, that's where you should click if you have any questions to ask. And Janet and I will do our very best to answer them all. And we will put some to the panelists as well after their presentations. Uh, if you would like to make any comment which is not a question, you can do so in the chat channel. Bear in mind that if you want everyone to read you should select uh, send to panelists and attendees. Uh, the webinar will end by asking you for feedback and we would really appreciate it if you took a moment to let us know if you enjoyed it, uh, whether it ran smoothly, um, whether is, there's anything we can improve and if it was interesting and useful for you. And uh, Next up, before we hear from our first panelists, we have a short and brilliant video, um, which Ezekiel, who's here with us, made just last week. Ezekiel works for the Uganda National Apiculture Association, uh, that's Tunado. And yes, let's watch that. Hello, everyone. 
together. like this let me take you through hot water method processing you will need a saucepan two sticks of about a meter and also you need a sack preferably a new sack to avoid chances of contamination we shall also need the water and clean water then for safety reason gloves is important for the power in this process. Well, now we need the comb. You may have a dry comb like this, or a process comb like this. If it's dry comb or uh, an cross comb yet, you may see if you need to sort it out. Fresh combs or new com newer combs give better results. But the dark combs has a lot of impurities, possibly more pollens even it because of being overused. If possible, do it separately. You can clean by washing in water to remove the sugar or honey which contain acid. Rinse in the water, but to see whether the water is enough, you now have to do judgment when comb is hard like this is not moving freely that means the water is not enough you can add until the stick is freely moving that gives you good proportion of water and comb as it heats the wax will melt into the hot water and the color changes tells you that it's doing well until it becomes dark. If it's uniformly dark like this, then it's ready. Don't waste any time. But pour it through the sack for straining with the help of the stick. You can get that. It's hot. Squeeze as much as possible to drain any molten wax into the collecting container. To start plotting immediately, press it on the top layer. After squeezing thoroughly, then put the content under shade and you can empty the waste. It can also serve as animal feed. Meanwhile, the molten wax in the saucepan should be kept covered to avoid the bees from flying and drowning and dying. But after it gets solidified, empty, and clean the bottom, which has dirt and pollen. With the help of knife or panga, break this hard cake in smaller pieces, a process to clean. With the help of two saucepans, one bigger than the other one, you can pour water in the bigger one, and while the saucepan, small one will collect the broken pieces and set the content in fire. As it heats, to keep on melting, keep on stirring so that it melts uniformly until it is completely liquid. So using fine cloth like this, not mosquito net like this to avoid contamination. You can filter through and leave it to cool. As it cools, the liquid wax will turn into hard cake wax like this. Yes. You can remove it from the pan and you can store it. Your wax is finally extracted using hot water. Thank you 
for what you need. Thank you, Ezekiel and Sean, for that fantastic video. It was made just last week in Gulu in northern Uganda, and it's almost like magic the way you get those beautiful golden discs of beeswax from the combs. It's just so good to see that video. Many of us have seen it in action, but I've actually never seen a video of it before. So we really encourage more people to make nice videos of how to do these things. It's really helpful. So now we're going to move on and it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker who's joining us from early morning USA from uh, Watertown in Connecticut. It's John Costa, who's president of Costa Kunen, a manufacturing company based in Connecticut and in the Netherlands. And Costa Kunen uh, buys beeswax from all over the world and sells it on to end users. And the company started in 1852 by John's great, great grandparents. So he's the fifth generation of the family running this business and uh, therefore certainly knows all there is to know about beeswax. So over to you, John. Nicola, thank, thank you for that introduction. I, 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 I try to learn as much as I can about beeswax, but I tell you, I'm, I'm always learning. Um, I've been involved in, in, in the family business since uh, uh, I was about 14 years old. Um, so this really is, this is my life. It's my, my passion. Um, uh, as you said, the business was started in 1852 in the Netherlands. Uh, we, uh, we moved uh, after the war, uh, we moved to New York, expanded uh, there in 1945. Uh, and eventually in, in 55, uh, my grandparents moved back to the Netherlands uh, and restarted the facility there. Um, in 95, we moved from New York and now we are where we are here in, in Connecticut. So uh, we have continuous manufacturing in the US, uh, Europe. And um, most recently we uh, opened a facility in, uh, in, in Lome, in, in Togo, in, uh, in West Africa. Uh, this is our picture of our two facilities in uh, in Connecticut and in the Netherlands. Um, what what do we do with the wax? Um, we 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 take the crude wax, we refine it. Um, we have a product development team, uh, and we have our R and D labs in both facilities in the U.S. and in the Netherlands. And we're always trying to come up with new and innovative uses for uh, for that beeswax. Um, once it's refined, uh, we can take that uh, yellow material, we refine it to a white, we can passlate it. This is a pictures of our processing machines here. Uh, we make these, uh, we make beads out of them. Uh, we can also make a five kilo blocks um, or we can spray. Um, and depending on the use, some people like any one of those three um, uh, forms. Um, in the U.S., we do about uh, 30,000 kilos of wax a day. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of, uh, of what the capacity is and, and what the demand is. Uh, and, and then, of course, how much we need to source. And that's, that's a lot of wax. Um, we, we, of course, we do more than just beeswax, although that's our primary product. We do some petroleum-based products. We do some est esters, which is uh, uh, some specific chemistry uh, on, on different waxes. We functionalize waxes. We make them water soluble where beeswax isn't on its own water soluble. And that all helps with, um, you know, increasing our market in terms of where we can sell the product. Um, we're, we're, uh, we've got a, uh, 2,500, uh, panel solar farm here in the U S, uh, eliminates, uh, creates about 660 kilowatts of, uh, of, uh, Solar, uh, solar electricity, clean electricity. We've got a similar system in uh, at our factory in, in Holland, but that's not really what we're here to talk about. Um, so in two, 2017, we uh, wanted to get more involved directly with the beekeepers. Uh, we had a partnership uh, with um, some folks in West Africa and decided to uh, open up a facility there. Uh, and the reasoning was we would have much more direct contact with the beekeepers, so we could 
we could train, we could source, um, uh, rather than buying through aggregators as we had done in the past. Our focus area here in um, West Africa is uh, is Togo, Nigeria, Mali, um, Ivory Coast, uh, Ghana, and, and Burkina. Um, our mission when we when we started this, our mission was to uh, establish a sustainable export supply chain. Right, it creates jobs and it will empower and does empower a large number of the shareholder smallholder farmers, uh, which can yield a significant income in West Africa. And here's some of the pictures of our uh, of our partners. And you talk about the um, the yellow wax and and that for us was the biggest challenge uh, in West Africa in particular. Um, they would use methods to extract the wax and it would yield a dark smoky material. And for us as, as the buyer, um, there's less of a home, there's less of a market for the darker material. So the cleaner that we can get this wax, the, the more tra training that we do uh, and, and the better uh, color and lower odor, it, it, there's a better market for, for that material internationally. Um, and there was a comment made in the in the presentation in Uganda just a few minutes ago about filtering the beeswax. And we want to say one of the most important uh, aspects in, in filtering the wax in the field is not to use the mosquito nets. Um, the mosquito nets are typically treated with a permethrin to uh, kill the mosquitoes. What happens when you run the wax through those mosquito nets is that permethrin will wash into the beeswax. And many of our customers have specifications that we have to test for, and one of those tests is permethrin. So if they find that in the wax, that again um, uh, will hurt the value of the wax because it limits where we can sell it. So we can't sell the wax into a food uh, a food application if, in fact, it has the permethrin. So I, I really want to uh, reiterate that point, please. You know, try to find another uh, another way to filter the wax than using these um, mosquito nets. Um, let's see here. So we made this. Um, you know, what 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 do we do, and how do we make a positive impact, and how can we improve the lives of of our beekeepers? Right, the challenges in the region, right, high unemployment, poverty, food security, climate change. Well. You know, if we invest in, in more and better hives and equipment, uh, we invest in training and modern techniques, we invest in a small supply chain, the results are going to be higher volumes of wax and excellent quality of beeswax. We believe in the shared value system, right? There's the economic development for, for the farmers uh, and it improves everybody along the way in that supply chain. Um, so the products go into you know, eventually it will go into lipsticks, into creams, into lotions. But what it does in Africa is it increases the biodiversity. And most importantly, and what we've focused a lot of our training on is by keeping bees, there's more pollination, right? And the more pollination means more food. And that helps, of course, with the food security. Um, and we're a family business. Right. So one of the big things we want to do is we want to be able to impact other family businesses. This is a picture of us um, with our managing director in the middle. That's uh, Silvan from Togo. And then the gentleman on the right is uh, Herbin Bursma from our uh, he's managing director of our facility in Holland. And this was taken in uh, in northern Nigeria back in uh, June of, of last year. So our goal is, you know, we can impact other families, other family businesses. Um, and by training folks on the value of beeswax, uh, we were able to, 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 we were talking to one of our, our partners and he was a village chief in Togo. And what he said was people used to take the beeswax and they would throw it out. It was trash or they would burn it. Um, but, uh, as we increase the knowledge of the importance of the wax, um, his folks, they're starting to understand this value. Um, and thanks to the training that we've done, um, the production capacities have improved. The production has improved. Um, we're able to supply a guaranteed price. We're able to guarantee the market um, and therefore increase the, uh, the income of 
of, of those beekeepers. And I have a few slides about that. Um, but incredibly important in this whole chain is that pollination is necessary for 70% of all of the crops that, that we eat. Uh, one third of our food comes from plants that are pollinated by bees. Some, some of our beekeepers that we've worked with used to have to pay the farmers to put the bees in their fields. Um, and what we've done is try to communicate that that's not, um, you know, th th there should be some symbiotic relationship there. Let the, let the beekeeper put the, put the bees in their fields. The bees will increase the yield of the crops and the beekeepers will have more honey, more wax, and equally important, the farmer will have more food. Um, Also talk about diversity in um, in in uh, you know, in in the fields um, in terms of you know be beeswax producers uh, they live on on smallholder farms right so it's so in fact the farmer should also be the beekeeper but again this is part of the training that we're focused on uh, on doing in this area um, and farmers who benefit when the bee populations thrive. So this is all new information to, to some farmers. Um, wild bees pollinate a huge array of crops and it supports the biodiversity, the crop resilience, as well as the ecosystem. It maintains soil fertility, it limits soil erosion, it limits flooding, it limits desertification. Um, and basically this biodiversity underpins all of the economic activity that, that, that surrounds beekeeping. It's an incredibly important point that can't be missed when, um, you know, when we're talking about the importance of bees. But, you know, what's in it for the beekeeper, right? So it's, it's income. Um, beekeeping generates a huge array of products, including honey, which can be sold. Pollen is sold. The wax can be sold. On average, beekeeping contributes 25 to 35% of farmer household income. So somebody who wasn't beekeeping, who is now beekeeping, you know, can make 30% more per year. Um, wax is the most valued product in beekeeping. Uh, and that's, you know, you know, it's probably like an eight to one, eight to two ratio in terms of eight kilos of honey, one or two kilos of wax. But somebody with 10 hives, uh, we found, uh, can average six harvests a year and generate up to $3,000 additional income per farmer. It's an incredibly important point, can't be missed. We did two, we did two case studies, one in Burkina, where we found that uh, pollinating co cotton uh, increased, the, uh, increased the, uh, the yield of the cotton about 40%, and that increased the value of that cotton 30 to $36 per hectare. Similar <clears throat> increases in shade. Uh, we did the same thing in Ghana and Nigeria with um, um, cashews. And um, each, each cashew hive produces four kilos of honey a year, but improvements in the production techniques that, that, that can be learned means they can get up to 20 kilos of honey and almost three kilos of beeswax. So um, again, it's just the economics of this are, are incredibly important. Um, there's some pictures of us. Uh, we were training the uh, organic uh, cashew farmers in uh, in Nigeria. This was again last uh, last June, a year ago. Um, so far, our West African facility, we produced uh, 103,000 kilos of sustainable beeswax. Um, we provided, we we've identified 10,000 beekeepers that are in our group, um, and and incredibly importantly, 1,100. Uh, of those beekeepers, almost 1,200 of those beekeepers are women. And we are really focused on trying to increase uh, the education for uh, women beekeepers. Um, we provided in 19, 5,500 hives, 221 bee suits in the equipment and gave more than 500 hours of training. Um, we've also introduced pollination services. So this is where actually the beekeepers will go out and charge the farmers something very small, but, um, you know, to show them, hey, if you have bees on this property, look how much more your yield is than if you don't have bees. Um, 2020 results uh, are, are a little bit higher in terms of kilos produced of sustainable beeswax. Uh, we worked with 1,100 
11,000 beekeepers. Um, the numbers were uh, projected to be a little bit higher, but unfortunately, because of uh, COVID, um, we've had to uh, uh, slow down some of the training just because of the travel restrictions. Uh, but this year, we provided an additional 5,000 hives, uh, bee suits and equipment, and provided 220 hours of training. Some of that in person, some of that via, via Zoom. And we continue to work with our pollination services to introduce the benefits of pollination to those farmers. Um, we, we're, we're, we're estimating that the indirect beneficiaries of this project are about 71,000 people. Those are, um, those are beekeepers, their families, the local carpenters, artisans, people making the bee suits. Everything that we do, we try to do locally. We're not importing the bee suits. We're not, uh, uh, you know, we're making everything as close to where they're used as possible. Um, so I think one of the most important things for today's conversation is to really talk about what is the training, right? What is, what is good? What is good wax? Our the, the folks that we work with, they get paid a premium on light wax. If you look here on the right side of this slide, there's a there's a color uh, graph. So the the more the lighter the wax is. Uh, the more value that, that, that there is to us, because ultimately in the U.S. and in the Netherlands, what we do is we, um, uh, we, we take the wax and we have to pull whatever color is in the wax. We have to pull that out. We have to create a white product. The end consumer wants a white product with low odor. So if we buy a very dark product like this one on the, on the bottom right where it says brown wax, that takes a lot more effort. And in fact, there's more loss when we're doing the refining. So if we could start up here in the top left-hand corner, um, maybe we have two or three percent loss versus ten or twelve percent loss, and that yields directly uh, it, it, to the to the beekeeper in, in terms of what, how much can be paid uh, per kilo. The equipment that we are providing is, you know, bee suits. It, it, we we've been out in in areas where uh, beekeepers don't have the proper protective clothing. Um, you know, so we're trying to provide as much protective clothing as we can. Um, smokers are incredibly important rather than smoking a huge area and creating a big fire. If you can localize the smoking to just a, a smoker like this, that would mean less smoke actually ultimately getting into the honey, into the wax and a lighter and a, and a better product. Um, harvest buckets are important. The bee brush is important. But again, as we talked about, the, um, the filter, the, the method of using of how you're going to filter the, um, the particles out of it is incredibly important just uh, to prevent that contamination. Um, this is a questionnaire that we have the beekeepers fill out in our sustainability program. We wanna know what, what the bee, bees are, are pollinating, what, uh, what, was in, what, what kind of bees, uh, or what kind of beekeeping uh, hives they were using, what the quality of the product was. And then we track the price paid because we want to make sure that there's you know, we, we set a farm gate price that you know, we can hopefully uh, you know, be sure that the beekeepers are getting paid a, a, a fair amount. And that is really beneficial because we're not working with an aggregator. We're not working with a middle, a middle person. We're work, working directly with the beekeeper. So we know from the, the kilo of wax that arrives in the US or in the Netherlands, we know exactly where that came from and who the farmer was and how much they were they were paid. Some of our partners um, that we work with, uh, to whom we sell the products, is, uh, Estee Lauder, that's uh, used in their creams, their lotions, Burt's Bees is an incredibly important partner with us. So in fact, we're partnering with them and, and USAID to provide even more training. Um, but again, it, it boils down to funding. USAID has been generous. Um, but the, the beeswax that is in Burt's Bees lip Bombs. That's from uh, that's majority of that comes out of Africa, both both East and West Africa. We have a proprietary blend that we make for them. L'Oreal is one of our primary uh, sustainability partners. You can find us uh, on their website uh, as one of their sustainability partners. They buy a significant amount of wax for us that goes into their creams and their lotions and sticks. Uh, and Unilever is another very important partner for us for uh, for for the African wax <clears throat> and. And the reason that we have to find these, these partners is the African wax is, is a little bit more expensive than wax from Asia. So we have to go and really sell the value add of, 
of knowing who the farmers are that we're dealing with and the special quality of the African wax over some waxes from Asia, which are two or three dollars a kilo less expensive. So for us, we're always looking for these important partners uh, who, who recognize that additional value. You know, we we kind of uh, we set up this facility in West Africa. Um, we thought it was something that we could do to make the folks lives in West Africa that we partner with a little bit easier and uh, and we're and we're proud to do it. And that's, you know, that's, that's my presentation and I'm, I'm happy to take any, any questions um, from the team. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting presentation. Um, we have got lots of questions for you, uh, but my colleague Janet is... <laughs> You're on mute, Janet. It's me, it's me. I'll present some questions to John. Okay, fine. We've got fine. a barrage of them. Yeah. So, uh, first one from Paul. Recent studies have shown high levels of pesticides in beeswax. What process do you use to remove these pesticides if that can be done? That's the problem, right? These pesticides, they're esters. They, 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 they just cannot be removed. Um, so it's just it it's it's training to say uh don't put your bees where where they're where they're where they're laying down pesticides we found in africa the level of pesticides far far lower than in other than in other areas um in asia they are in asia in south america and in, and in north america they, they the use of pesticides is prevalent um and when we get the wax and we refine it and we send it out for testing it's there um, in, in African wax, so in, in Tanzania, a lot of our suppliers in Tanzania actually have their hives in uh, regulated uh, forests, and there's there's no agricultural uh, activity in those forests except for beekeeping. That wax is clean, and that's one of the beautiful things about uh, about the African wax is that the the amount of pesticide it, it's far far lower. In fact, the 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 the, big, the biggest problem, and and I've said it a couple of times, the biggest problem is the permethrin that 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 comes out of the um, the mosquito nets. But but in general, the African material is is pure and it's un, uh, unadulterated with with pesticides. But I can tell you, when it's in there, it is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to get out. Um, thank you, John. Another question is from Aubrey. What is the price paid per kilogram of clean wax in Togo? Yeah, I, I is that that's something that, you can share. I I don't have that exact number. Our teams in our teams in Togo would would have that information. Mm. I, I I don't, and it wouldn't be right for me to to to, to guess. Yes, that's fair enough. And. Somebody asked a question about... Um... Neil is asking if there's a difference in the price for beeswax source from different bee species. In my limited experience, I found that Apis serana is better quality than Apis mellifera or dorsada. Well, the, the, the resultant beeswax from... Um, from the Africanized bee, the, the, the quality is not that different. We we don't um, we wouldn't pay a difference. Um, you know what we're looking for. We've got several specifications, and if it meets those specifications, such as melt point, saponification, acid value, cloud point, um, and all of the Africanized bees need this specification. Mm -hmm. There is Indian beeswax. It's um, that comes from the bee in South India that produces a, a beeswax with a very low acid value and a, and a higher melt point. This is wax that does not meet the specification, so we, we can't, we just can't buy it. Um, uh, we we do very limited, but it would only be used in a candle application, something like that. But in general, um, We're one more question. the bees are, are acceptable. <laughs> Thanks, John. And is there any particular method you advocate um, in terms of cleaning, in terms of processing the wax, gentle. Um, so we've we've seen we've seen it all. We've seen where they uh, where folks will take um, the comb 
the honey and they'll put it in a 55 gallon uh, drum uh, put some water in the bottom, put some sticks and leaves in the top, light it on fire, and then and then you know the, the heat will melt the honey and, and melt the uh, the wax, and then it separates. But the problem is you end up with so much um, uh, so much ash in the in the wax, it becomes incredibly difficult to filter out. We don't recommend that. The hot water the hot water treatment is absolutely the cleanest and it's the most gentle uh, uh, method, and we would we would recommend that just as we saw earlier in that video that's absolutely perfect wonderful thanks john that's really great so thank you very much um i'd like now to welcome uh, sarah so first of all let me introduce uh, dr sarah rob i'll just say a few words so uh, sarah started her career in academic research but then later moved on to and uh, set up a company bath potions making uh, honey soaps and creams using beeswax. She's published a number of books with recipes about uh, making cosmetics using honey and beeswax and uh, has written a book about the um, antioxidant properties of honey. And Sarah runs lots of workshops and we're really priv privileged to welcome her to our webinar today. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, what I would like to do is I'm going to tell you about what I do and I'm going to show you a very simple recipe um, to make a value added product. Um, I really enjoyed John's talk because um, a number of years ago, my family went to Tanzania and we saw a beeswax processing site and I taught um, the, the beekeepers there how to make soap with honey and with beeswax. Um, because we have only a short amount of time today, um, I'm not able to show you how to make soap, but what I'm going to show you is how to make another value added product with beeswax. Um, and I would like to say, if you are a smallholder, no matter where you are in the world, if your beeswax that you're using in these products isn't completely white, it's okay, actually, um, I prefer beeswax that has a little bit of color and that has some aroma for small holding um, cosmetics and products. I think it gives it more character. So I think if you sell your prime wax to John and then use maybe the wax with a little, little aroma and a little color um, to make these products. So um, what I'm going to show you how to make is a uh, beeswax wax um, body butter um, bar. And um, I have the recipe just over here, uh, I think you can see. And this recipe first appeared in BBKA News, and it was in October of 2019. And this is the, the issue. Um, so this can be made um, really anywhere in the world and you don't need any special equipment to do this. Um, what you will need is you need a scale perhaps and you do need some way to melt your ingredients. Um, this could be a microwave, it could be a stove, it can be over a fire, it doesn't matter, any of these things will work. Um, so I'm just going to put my gloves on and show you um, the product as well as how to make this and share the recipe. Um, so I have a scale here. It doesn't need to be a fancy scale like this, um, but some kind of a scale is very useful. Um, I'm also, uh, because I'm going to microwave the mixture today, um, I have just a Pyrex jug. But again, you could do this in a saucepan, um, something over the fire, that's all fine. Um, so the beeswax that I'm using today um, are actually little beads of beeswax, just like what John spoke about. But as you can see, I've opted for the yellow color because I like the color that um, yellow beeswax gives to products. So I have some beeswax here and it has a nice aroma, it's unrefined. Um, I'm also going to be using coconut oil. Now, many of you 
are lucky enough to live on islands where the coconut oil would be liquid most of the year. Um, here in the UK, it's a little bit more chilly, and so the coconut oil is solid. Um, unrefined coconut oil has a lovely aroma. It smells like coconut cookies baking. It reminds me of my childhood. If you can get that, that's fantastic. If not, um, refined coconut oil will work as well. And the final ingredient I have is some cocoa butter. And this cocoa butter is unrefined, so it smells very much like a chocolate bar. Um, again, you could use refined coconut, um, cocoa butter, and that's fine too. Um, and I have little, little chips of cocoa butter. It's just easier for a demonstration like this, but you can use whatever you have available to you. Um, so the recipe is quite simple. Um, I have it on the card here. And you can see it only is three ingredients um, in the main base of the recipe. And then to that, you could add some fragrance oil or some essential oil. And today I'm going to add a little bit of essential oil. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and show you how to make it right now. So I have my scale and I'm going to be weighing 45 grams of beeswax. I'm going to be doing this sitting down so you can still see me, I hope. Um, so I'll just go ahead and turn this on. And just put this in. There we go. Um, I'm also going to use 45 grams of my coconut oil. Okay, and I'm adding 60 grams of my cocoa butter. There we go. And now I'm just going to melt this. Um, so I will be one second because I melted one earlier. Okay, so this is one that I put into melt earlier. Um, so we'll go ahead and use this one now. Um, and so I just want to stir the ingredients and then I'm going to add a little bit of essential oil, um, maybe about six drops, but to your taste and you can use different essential oils. There we go. And then I will just give this a stir. And I'm going to pour this into a mold. Now, if you don't have a fancy mold, the one that I'm using um, makes this lovely um, embossed B on the top. If you don't have something like that, that's fine. You can use something as simple as a cupcake casing, put that into a cupcake pan and just pour into that. And then you could label this or wrap it. Um, you can sell, sell it in different tins or another idea would be to use beeswax wraps and wrap um, those around the body butter bar tie them with a little bow and that would be fantastic. And you then are using another beeswax product um, to sell, sell those. Um, if you don't have any of these specific ingredients, you can change the recipe slightly and use ingredients that are available to you. So for instance, if you don't have coconut oil, you could substitute in corn oil or soy oil, whatever you have available to you. If you don't have uh, cocoa butter, you might have shea butter and you could use that. So the ingredients aren't fixed. 
with the exception of the beeswax. Um, and you can also change the recipe by adding uh, optional ingredients. So you might choose to add a little bit of honey. You could add a little bit of propolis, um, and that would be quite nice. Um, so be very creative when you're thinking about the varieties that you can make. Um, I think something like rosemary or pine essential oil with a bit of propolis tincture would be very nice indeed. Um, and again, you can put it into different forms and that's fine. Um, and finally, if you have um, a body butter bar that is either too soft or too hard, you can correct this. Um, so some of you are living in um, warm places in the world, um, not as cold as it is here in England. And so you might want to add a little extra beeswax to the body butter bar because it will raise its melting point and the, the temperature that it melts at. If you're living somewhere where it's very cold, um, you might want to add a little bit extra liquid oil and that will make the body butter bar slightly softer so that it's easier to use. Um, and in, indeed in somewhere like England where we have um, the seasonal temperatures, you might want to add a little more beeswax in the summer and a little less in the winter. Um, but very, very easy to make and something that can be sold alongside your honey and your other beeswax products um, as a value added product um, anywhere in the world without any special equipment. Did we have any questions? Thank you so much, Sarah. You're That's very fantastic. Welcome. Yes, uh, we did have some questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of them is, uh, can you tell us something about the um, the benefits of honey as an active ingredient in skincare products? Sure. Um, actually, well, I know the symposium is about beeswax. I have to admit that my favorite ingredient um, is honey. And the reason I love honey so much is that there are so many different varieties depending on what the bee has been feeding on. Um, and so you have light honeys, you have dark honeys. Um, in cosmetics, honey is humectant, it's an emollient. Um, it is very good um, at softening the skin. It, um, I don't know if I have time to tell you um, about um, some of our experiences with honey that go beyond cosmetics actually. Um, honey also is very healing. And so by adding honey to cosmetics, you're probably adding another layer to the cosmetic um, that you probably can't claim to that. Um, Some of the things that we up with honey called serrate, and there's an article in Bees for Development about this, and this is simply beeswax, honey, um, and olive oil. And um, it's a kind of an old fashioned um, ointment that you can use. And when my daughter Maggie was very young, we were visiting a farm and Maggie got into some nettle and she had blisters on her arm. We put the honey serrate on her arm at, and this was at night and in the morning, we could not figure out which arm it was because the blisters were gone. We kept looking saying, which arm was it? Which arm was it? Um, you know, and, and people have also contacted me in the past and said, oh, the cream that you're making with honey um, and beeswax has helped heal um, scarring that I've had from cancer surgery, for instance. Um, and so thank you, Sarah. That's great. That's really, really great. We've got another question. Okay, I'll just sorry. move on to the next question. But yes, that recipe, by the way, is in Bees for, Bees for Development Journal issue 118, if anybody wants to look that up. So the other question that we had was um, about the texture of cream, hand creams. Yes. Uh, sometimes 
uh, it doesn't absorb very well into the skin. Um, okay. And it's, uh, what, what's the issue there? What's the problem there? Okay, I think it depends on what you are meaning when you say cream. Some people, okay. um, some people call um, non-aqueous mixtures creams incorrectly. Um, so if you have uh, a cream that is made with beeswax, water, and other oils, and it is an emulsion, um, it is much better um, and will be more easily absorbed into the skin. If it's something, uh, a recipe similar to this, which I've seen some people call cream, that will absorb as well. Um, but I think you really need to have the right balance of ingredients and the emulsion needs to be made um, in a really stable way in order for you to make a product that absorbs well into the skin and it doesn't feel greasy. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. That's great. I really, really appreciate it. And I think we're going to um, move on to the broader Q&A uh, session now. So I think we've got some questions for uh, the other panelists as well. Um, what should, who should we start with? I've got one here for um, about a solar using solar wax. Uh, ex can you use the solar wax extractor? I don't know, Kwame, whether you're whether you could answer something or contribute something like that if you've got experiences using a solar wax extractor. Ah, yes, Kwame. <coughs> yes. Uh... In the tropics, where the uh, sunlight heat is good, you could build yourself a solar wax extractor. And uh, uh, after washing the, the empty combs, you could place them in the, in the extractor and it will melt very well. But uh, one mistake that people do is they put the honeycombs in the ex uh, extractor, the solar it is wax extractor, not for honey. So the honey gets overheated, and then that turns out to be not a good product for the honey. But the wax comes out good. So the caution here is that you, you need to extract the honey first before you wash the combs and then place them in the uh, solar wax extractor. In, in the temperate conditions, it, it gets very slow unless the day has a lot of good sunshine so uh, the solar wax extractor works very well in the tropics where the sun the sun's heat is great thank, thank you kwame you. thank you kwame yes so a good solution for sunny beeswax processing uh, uh, We've got a question for Ezekiel, going back to the uh, video at the beginning about the hot water method. Is there a danger that um, possibly, we've already, John's maybe touched on this already, but is there a danger of actually overheating the wax when you're melting it in the hot water? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, we know the boiling point of water goes up to 100 and wax is about 65. So the moment the wax reaches its melting point, the more you heat, you remove some properties and even the color will change, it become darker and then very white. So it is very important not to exceed the boiling point of water. Thank you, Ezekiel. I think uh, I'm going to ask Giacomo to ask some questions. Yes, yeah, so we have another question that came up twice for John, which is about the quantity of wax that um, needs the kind of minimum quantity that needs to be consolidated for uh, you to consider buying from a particular area. I, I think it, it it depends on on the area. So if if we're in Nigeria or uh, or Mali or um, an area where we have um, a market set up already uh, with with our with teams in in the region, then it can be five kilos, 10, 15 kilos. But if we're in Uganda, for example, we don't have anybody in in Uganda. It would have to be a, a larger amount. I think it was be a 
a case by case basis. Let's see where where the where the team is and and what quantity they they have. But I mean, it rarely it, it would make sense for for a group to get together, maybe put together a ton of of wax, and then um, that economically makes sense for travel uh, and and for for transport of the of the product. Thanks, John. And we also have a question for Sarah, which is if you could very, very briefly uh, cover the health benefits of beeswax, uh, body butter. Uh, so if there's any particular bits in the wax that is good for the skin, basically. Sure. Um, beeswax is very good in cosmetics and it's um, a very old and very popular ingredient. And the reasons that it's used is because um, it's very emollient and it also is film forming. So if you use a beeswax body butter bar, for instance, um, on your skin, it will form a, fi a film on your skin and it will um, help your skin retain the moisture. Um, and it also will moisturize your skin. It's a humectant. And so um, those are some of the reasons that it is such a good um, product to use in cosmetics. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. So I've got a question for Isaac. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit, Isaac, about the beekeepers that you work with in Ghana. Um, how do they... Maybe about how they bring their beeswax. Uh, to market. Okay, so um, my experience working with the, um, I was actually the actual growers that we work with in the middle belt of Ghana. Um, we usually, um, these cashew growers find it difficult to um, sell their cashew, uh, their beeswax from the, the uh, their business, beekeeping business. So, uh, Bee for Development Ghana, we have partnered with um, Honey Center in Sopon, where we organize all the beeswax produced by these beekeepers in the project area. And then we, um, because of quality, we want, we usually uh, further process these this work that we collect from different um, beekeepers so that the quality will be improved before we send it to um, Honey Center. And these um, beekeepers are paid directly by Honey Center into their uh, either uh, mobile money wallet or something. So uh, we've been doing successfully done that um, this year and we hope to continue in the subsequent years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac. So there's another question here. I don't know, we're getting probably close to drawing an end to the Q&A, but maybe just one more question uh, for John. Um, what, is the, um, what is the end use, the largest end use of beeswax by volume in the- in Great in the USA? Great question. I, I, um, it, it, it has to be in cosmetics, but what, you know, it, it, and it's used in all, all kinds of cos cosmetics. So creams, lotions, balms, um, what Sarah, Sarah was talking about how, how to make a, a balm. That's really what beeswax's primary uh, use is uh, in personal care. It, it thickens, it thickens oil. Um, and I and I agree when I agree with Sarah in, in in the desire for a little bit of color, there's a little bit of depth to to, to the wax, um, you know. But our customers have all kinds of specifications. But um, but it's typically a a, a a thickener, and it's and 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 all of the health benefits that Sarah talked about are are spot on. You know, it's it's a humectant. It protects the skin. It it retains moisture in the skin. It is one of the most perfect natural products that, that you can use on your body. It's been used um, by 
uh, people for thousands of years. They used beeswax in bombs in, in Egyptian times, and they, they found reference to this inside the, the, the pyramid. So it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. It is an absolutely terrific natural product for, uh, for use on, on, on our bodies. I think that's but, a, a very nice statement for us to wind up, John. I think our, our time is up today. Um, it's really nice to think that people all around the world have spent one hour thinking about beeswax, one of our favourite subjects. Um, so let's hope we've moved, moved us all along a bit with beeswax. Thank you so much to all our lovely contributors today, Sarah and John and Ezekiel. Thank you so much. And to our panellists for joining us and all of you who've joined this webinar. It's just fantastic that we can be in touch this way with all of you nowadays. The next webinar will be on the 25th of November next month. So if you registered to join us today, you'll automatically get an invitation to the next one. So tell us what you thought. We're seeing hundreds and hundreds of comments coming in and questions, and we'll try to respond to all of you. But do get in touch and tell us uh, about what you'd like us to cover next time. Thank you so much to all of you, and bye-bye uh, from Monmouth. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> bye bye.